Uh, James McLaughlin joins me now. James, uh, hello, good morning to you, James. Yes, Greg. How are you? Ah, Madeline, just not not that great. Madeline, just... Yeah, I would say so. Trying to take it day by day. Uh, through through this whole process, James, uh, you know it's difficult from a, from a local media covering something that's happening so far away, away in Australia. Uh, we've been contacted constantly by the public in support of uh, both uh, the the uh, McLaughlin and Kelly families. You know, people in your community, people in your county, in the region, conscious uh, conscious of the difficulty, uh, the difficult time you are going through as well. Yes, that's that's correct. Yes. Yeah. Right, James, uh, you're the father of Christopher McLaughlin. Uh, Christopher McLaughlin, he is uh, one of two men charged with the death of a 66-year-old man in Sydney. And those charges, unfortunately, uh, following uh, the, the, the victim's uh, life support machine being switched off, were upgraded to murder. We'll, we'll talk about that in the moment, but tell us a little bit about Christopher and, and, and why he decided to go to Australia. Well... He left on May 18 and uh, the 20th of May. He was working here for two and a half years in the, the forward emperors on Mallon Head. And, and he, he decided to, to better himself in and to go a bit further and talked about America and talked about Australia. But eventually he decided on Australia and him and his friend Nathan, the two of them, went on the, the 20th. And uh, they were always... He would always phone or every day since he went out until that happened. He would always have contact with him almost every day. Um, is this this getting involved in something like this, and we'll talk about what you believe happened, is this out of character for Christopher? Has he been in oh, much trouble uh, before? I mean, everyone gets into a bit of trouble, but has he uh, been in uh, anything like this before? He never ever been in any trouble anywhere, and uh, even in, in the factory or or nor in the Port Olympus in Mount Head, he never was in any and no bother at all, and uh, I never heard of it. You know, all of the other young fellow in Nathan, mm. uh, he would be type of a quiet type of a young fellow, very tight, uh, quiet and shy. You know, he wouldn't uh, at all ever. They, they had a night out that night, and they were on their way home, and. Uh, come to their home with a rented house and this man was backing into their jeep. Their own jeep? Now this would be the yes, jeep that... Yes, that Christopher. The jeep the truck that was Christopher's. Mm. And he was uh, breaking into that and they rolled and shouted and of course I don't really know for sure was it a an iron bar or was it a piece of conduit piping that he stuck Nathan Cayley over the back of and marked him, he's marked and the police photographed his back. And then I'd, I'd, I'd taken on from that, you know. And it was self-defence, in my opinion, self-defence. Whenever you're at your home and someone breaking into your, your jeep and on the spur of the moment, I mean, anything, and they didn't have a clue who the man was and whether he would maybe uh, could have killed them either. Uh, we haven't heard this yet, uh, but what we're hearing at the moment, uh, and we've had a couple of journalists on this programme, James, and I've sort of tried to lead them down that line because I'm not there and sort of ask, has any defence been offered yet or are or, or police... Look, like the, the police in their press releases seem to be very much going with along the lines of that this was a, a person who was asleep in the car and then was set upon, you know, um, oh. unprovoked attack. That's very different to what you believe happened. <coughs> That is not the case because the the, the, the truck belonged to Christopher, and from what we seen on the the TV footage, you could see the the police fingerprinting or the jeep, and that was definitely Christopher's jeep. And make, in my opinion, it was self defence. I mean, Nathan Carey has got marks on his back where he was stuck, and I mean, like, that, in my opinion, it was self defence then. James, when did what you happened? hear about what had happened? Because you were saying you were getting the calls and the texts every day. There was constant contact. Then they stopped. Uh, How did you uh, come to hear then about uh, the, the situation? Uh, when that on the twenty ninth, we that was a Saturday, and we were in the house in the evening, about between five. And six o'clock or around that time, sometime, this car came to the street 
and when I went to the door, it was near, nearly, near, nearly Kerry and Jerry. And of course, when I seen them, I r- realised there was something wrong because they don't usually be in my state. So then Nelly came in and just told us that I have a bit of bad news that the boys were arrested in Sydney. And uh, they were a man serious hell. But even at that point, you wouldn't have realised the, the seriousness of it. That really... No, I, I, I didn't realise. I didn't know if they could have to walk the jeep or what happened, what way it occurred. I hadn't, it was very serious. We didn't really know then what to think, you know. And we got no word other than that. The only other way we would have known that it would be on the media coming up on the television because it never, nobody ever sent word other than that to us. Mm. You know. Uh, presumably all this coverage and the language that's being used to, uh, and the pictures and stuff of, of Christopher, um, this is not the person you recognise at all. This must be really quite uh, oh, surreal for you. Oh, de- definitely not. Definitely not. I mean, like, and in the first one, I mean, if he had was on him, he bothered, he wouldn't have got out there and that. You know, you have to, you no, know, you wouldn't have got out for Australia. How difficult is it with you being here and and this all happening literally on the other side of the world that you can't, you know, physically be there with uh, Christopher very, or... Very, very difficult because you can't get phone calls to and when you get to, you're going from one person to another and you actually can't get contact in them at all. The only contact is that they can get phoning out and that's very hard too because... The, the money has to be put in a card and then put in and processed. And I hadn't worn out for him since last Thursday. And all I have only spoken to him three times, and it's very, very short. How is he? What's he saying to you? Obviously, not personal stuff, uh, no, James. No, but what's no, he? No. I know. Just he, 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 he sounds now fairly good on the on the thing, and just talking about being out in the, the prison and walking about, and they may may get work maybe after a while. Or, Something to do in the present, you know. Wow, and yeah. he's being treated all right. I mean, how's he getting on with other inmates? I don't know. I think he's. he's uh, we don't know a lot about that, but he, he seems to be not so bad, you know. And the that, I don't think it was good because the, with the holidays and having over there, and the short staff and having, you know, things was on a very good flow. But I think now it's it's better, but better. Mm. And, but it's very hard to get visits and and having. You have to. For people that's over there that want to run friends, has it's very hard to get in. It takes time to organise your visit and, and to get in then. Mm. You believe, of course, this to be a, a, a case of self defence. Are you. 100%. Are you afraid, though, that even if that defence is put forward, that, you know, that these are two Irish guys over in Australia, uh, you know, Australia might want to send a message that, you know, this stuff won't be tolerated. Are you fearful that they might be made an example of? Well, you're always, you know, kind of thinking maybe that way in times, but at the same time, you think that they'll get justice. I think, I hope they will anyway, you know. And in terms of about them getting a defence, you know, and having a defence team there again, you're all the way over here. I don't know if you uh, are, are able to or plan to travel over there, but but what kind of, how are you handling sort of, you know, their defence over there? Is it a case of employing uh, a legal team in Australia? Well, I, I think at the moment they're getting a, a, a private solicitor over there, you mm. know, because it would be much better to fight the case. And uh, they're getting a, a, a man to get a solicitor you know, to, to fight for them. I think they have to have a solicitor each. They can't, uh, one solicitor doesn't represent the two of them. And uh, but, uh, but it's going to be very, very costly. And I don't know if they're going to fund, try to raise money here in this, fund it in Ireland. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, and and uh, is it possible for you to get over there at any stage? I mean, we don't know how long this process will last. Um, even no. speaking to reporters over there, they don't know how quickly a, a case may become before the courts or how long that case would take. You know, I mean, I, I really feel that for, for, for you uh, and the family, uh, James, because there's so many questions that we can't actually answer at this stage. You know, it must be very difficult. But what is your plans? Do you think you can make it to Australia or...? Not at the moment anyway, but... You wouldn't know later, you know, but mm. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know. Uh, but uh, he would have an uncle that's going to go out there. Okay. And they're going out, you know. Right, they James. Can, at, at the minute, there's not a lot you can do if you were there. You know, it's maybe a bit closer to see when the case will be coming, you know. Mm. Stay there, James, because Nellie Kelly joins us also. Nelly, good morning to you. <laughs> good morning. Nelly, I know this is very, very difficult for you and the last thing you ever expected uh, to be doing, but I suppose there's a there's a, a, another side of the story as you would see that the families feel needs to get out there. Um, tell us uh, 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 about Nathan. Uh, I'll ask the same question to you that I asked James. Is there anything about what's happening in this whole situation that you recognise about Nathan or is this completely at odds with what you know about your, uh, your boy? Com- completely out of character, completely. He was such a laid-back, easy-going fella, and never was in trouble of any description. And anybody that he worked with, and anybody the the man he fished with here for the last two years, has told us that he socialised with him, and he fished with him for two years, and his jobs here. Whenever he gets back, he's such a laid-back, and. He was well, his nieces and nephews. He just played the PlayStation, Xbox was them, and they're only six and eight years of age. The, the nieces and nephews. But so out of character. And Nathan was in contact with me, the whole family, from the twentieth of May last year. <clears throat> and until that Friday, he was he wasn't active. That Friday evening, he wasn't active on Messenger. So you knew something was up. So when did you find out uh, about the incident then, Nelly? On the Saturday morning or maybe one or two o'clock on the Saturday, the 29th, they had bought two scramblers, Hum and Christopher. Mm. And I thought maybe they had an accident. And my son, Jared, rang and he says, why was, why was I not in bed all night? I said, because Nathan's not active on Messenger. So he says, would you not think maybe you're bringing a Sydney police station? Mm. Maybe something happened to him on the scramble. And they t- when I give Nathan's to the birth, they said he was arrested for assault. Nathan, uh, and we've got uh, references from the Tullinary nightclub, from the bouncers in Levy Kenny. Uh, all the time that he was on the nightclubs, he never caused no trouble. And if there were trouble in it, he helped the bouncers to put the people out. It would not there's no bad on them. And and what has he told you about what happened that night, Nelly? He said that this, this man was trying to break into Christopher's ute, a cheap. And he was hit over the back and they, they told the man to go, you know, go away and he'd come back again. So Nathan was with the man when the police arrived and the man was talking to them. There was no such thing as fist fighting. And if the case may be, that would have been all over the media if the man had a, had a cuts and bruises all over his face. But uh, I just think it's uh, there's more to tell the story, but we're 4,000, I think we're 100,000 miles away, 4,000 miles away. Yeah. How, how, are you, how are you coping with that aspect uh, of it, Nelly? Because your son is so far away, and I presume all you want to do is hold him and tell him everything will be okay, but... Yeah. Not coping. Not coping. Mm. Very bad. Uh, and it's got to the stage whereby you're not able to contact him directly. It's almost a case of having to fo- hold a couple of phones together and try and communicate that way. Yeah. All night we were up last night and he was ringing, but it was a couple of seconds. It was the noise in the background and only for his boss. I don't know what we would do. He's only working with the boss five months. I'm in Christopher and suddenly. And this my old man is like another son to us because he's in contact all the time and he do everything in his power. He's doing everything in his power. But that's the only... And, and we fell off the mountain head. 
Carrick, um, Doherty, mm. as in contact, keeping us updated. But depending on the embassy, I just rang them this morning again to see, can we not get a direct call? So we have Martin McDermott on it, and we have uh, Bernard McGuinness and Patrick McLaughlin trying to get help for us to see if we can get a direct call just to speak to Nathan. The uh, whole family is devastated. Have you heard how he's doing uh, in, in prison through those calls, Nelly? Is he faring up okay? or We're, we're just keeping Nathan's spirits up. We're keeping it. We're not, we just say, tell him, just, Nathan, just keep your head up. Do anything you're told to do. Do you know rightly any mother or any father that's on the way to about us on the way to Australia? So you know how they're feeling. Mm. I'm so far from home, and our family was such a close family. It's just oh. ripped you. You ripped the heart out of your chest. Oh I, I my think. god! I mean, listen. I don't think many people listening to this program could, you know, book flights, hop on a plane, and, and head over to Australia. And, and even if you did. You don't know what access you would have to your, your no son, access. Ali, so... There's no access. You have to wait a week to get an appointment to go to see them. Or maybe two weeks. It's just... There's no access to this person. Is the lack of information making it worse in that we don't know... I mean, we know when they may appear in court again, but we don't know how things progress in Australia, you know, what charges they'll, they'll actually eventually face in court... All that type of stuff is, is, is uh, I mean, even the bail process. Some people yeah. are saying that they were refused bail, but I don't think they applied for it. Like, no, they it must be very frustrating, you know, not knowing what to do or how to help, you know, or say, well, look, apply for bail, don't apply for bail, what to do, what not to do. Is that difficult? Yeah, very difficult, very difficult. We just don't, we're just getting no answers and people's coming in and being kind and saying, you know, it'll go over, it'll go over. But you just can't focus on getting up and we're trying to live in Sydney time. And we're up all night and then try to get a bit of sleep during the day. Mm. We're on, everybody in the house is on antidepressants, try to keep them calm. Just, it's, it's your worst nightmare. It's just like a death when you don't have the coffin here to show. Mm. And it's going on now for maybe three weeks on Saturday and still you no know, real contact on nothing. And, and, I mean, it, it's difficult because, and I'm not in any way trying to make it worse, Nelly, but I'm trying, I know, I, I'm trying to put myself in your position. There's no end in sight. In other words, you've got through these two or three weeks, but it's not like you can say right by this date or by that date, we'll know. It's open-ended and that must be incredibly, incredibly difficult for you and the rest of the family. Oh my God, and only for Kieran McLaughlin's making contact with his sister in Bunkrama. We have to thank all these people for helping, trying to help and trying to be in the position that you need to be in those shoes. It's just, it's awful. Oh, I just couldn't explain it to you because when you sleep, when you go to bed and close your eyes, it's on your mind. When you get up in the morning, it's on your mind. And we don't have time to, with the grandchildren, we don't have time with nothing. Our minds just focused on nothing because it's out of character completely, completely. Okay, Nelly, listen, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Nelly Kelly there. Um, James... <clears throat> the, the, I mean, obviously, you know, the the the, so the coverage is it would be saying one thing that this was a, a person sleeping in a jeep that he was set upon in an unprovoked attack. Uh, the defence, it seems, will be along the lines of uh, the fact that they disturbed him interfering with this vehicle. Whichever way this has happened, a, a life has been lost, uh, and there have to be some level of responsibility. I mean, are you considering that, James? That even if there is a defence of of self defence, that a, a, a life has lost, uh, been lost, and, and uh, both Christopher uh, and Nathan probably are are looking at prison time one way or the other in Australia. Yes, you have to, you have to accept that. But the other thing is, they were at their home and. A man was breaking into the, the jeep and like they didn't know what would be the outcome, like, you know, on the spur of the moment. No. I have to look at it from that point of view. They were at their home and 
a man was there breaking into their jeep. Mm. So, I mean, surely to God, they have to be self-defence. What the, I mean, I know one of the frustrations for, for your families, the families and the community is that it's sort of like one side of the story is coming out here. And, and I know that none of you want to speak to the press, but it's to get what you would see the other side of the story out there. At what stage, you know, will it be at a next court appearance that, uh, you know, an argument of self-defence or the explanation of some mitigating factors will be put before the courts? Because we we haven't heard that yet, you know, from, from any defence solicitors. There's been no real sort of answer to the charges, if that makes sense, James. Like, when do you expect uh, that that uh, a defence will start to be being put forward? Well, you'd ex- expect that it would happen now in the, 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 the said day of the 6th of March, but you never know before that. Maybe it could be put back or anything, but you would expect that, that, there would, that the solicitors would have got some information then from the other side, you know. I also want to say there were serious condolences to the the deceased man there and his family, from both families here. You know, sorry that it happened, but... Has there been any contact with with Paul's family? No. No, 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 no. But you'd welcome that, would you? Oh, aye, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Anything else you want to add, James? No, not really. I just... Just hope, hope that the outcome is good. And I'm sure the situation that Nelly described in her home of, you know, everyone sort of this is front and foremost in the minds. I'm sure it's the same in the McLaughlin family. Oh, definitely so. Definitely. All right. Hold them on. Yep. I am thanking everybody there for their support, everybody's support, you know, and especially them people and suddenly the... the the fellow from uh, what's he called? Uh, the fellow from Galway and and the the, the young fellow from Marlon Head. Yeah, but and Nelly mentioned those the the the, the uh, boss man and and Doherty, uh, I think the young yeah, Doherty fellow from. Okay. Without them, it would be a, a lot worse for us. We would have no information. You know, they're on they're on the ground there, and they're doing their very best. Yeah. Listen, I know it can be it can be very difficult, you know, reading and looking in the media, but it's until such time as the other side of it sort of starts being put forward that I'm sure the coverage will start feeling a bit more balanced, uh, uh, James. But listen, I, I appreciate. I'm uh, people are texting in left, right, and centre. They're very sympathetic to what the McLaughlin and Kelly families are going through. Their thoughts very much with you because you know. What we we don't want to hold our children back, and I'm sure when he said, "Look, I'm going to Australia," you were like, "Well, I wish you'd stay closer to home," but then you don't want to sort of stop him experiencing life, and you never no, thought you'd end up here. Not when he's twenty four. I mean, you don't like to see any of them going, but yeah. in the end, if it's to better themselves, you don't like to be stopping them either. So, okay, you know, but you never think that's what's ahead. Okay, James, thank you for, for speaking to us this morning. Thank you, Greg. Okay, and pass my best wishes to your um, your wife and also uh, Nellie Kelly. Nellie Kelly, the mother of Nathan Kelly, James McLaughlin, the father of Christopher McLaughlin, both men charged with murder following the death of a 66-year-old man in Sydney. Um, and, of course, you know, what we've heard so far is uh, the charges that they're facing and they make for very grim reading. Uh, but the families, and I know the community too, because even when we were speaking about this before, people were texting in saying, look, you don't know the full story. You're not given the full story. But it's only when we get exposed to it that we can uh, give it, uh, it, uh, people an opportunity to, to hear that. Uh, so I appreciate uh, Nelly and James coming on the programme and doing that with us.